2050, 70% of humans will be living in cities. And chances are you're currently watching this from a city. And cities are great. They are places of opportunity, cultural development, community, innovation, and if planned and designed accordingly, they will be key to adapting to and mitigating the looming climate crisis. But there's a downside to life in many cities. Us urbanites, we are spending more time than ever before indoors and more likely than not in front of our screens. Whether we are working or relaxing or even doing sport these days. And a recent EPA study found that Americans spend 93% of their time indoors, which is a little scary because we humans are hardwired to live in and with nature. It's what we've been doing for millions of years until very recently. Yet many city developers today are more preoccupied with raising nature to make way for more buildings, more roads, and more car parks, as opposed to creating more livable human habitats. And so we have become increasingly divorced from our natural habitats. And we must really ask ourselves, what kind of physiological and psychological disorders does this cause? And what can we do as individuals and as a society to reverse these trends? That is the topic of this video. Good day, welcome back. As you can see, I am not at home. I am surrounded by trees, a lake, and just nature, lots of it. The air is fresh. It sort of reminds me of Canada, but no, I'm not in Canada. I am only 100 kilometers away from Phnom Penh, the busy Cambodian capital. We drove up yesterday to Kirirom, a national park, to immerse ourselves a little bit in nature. And Kirirom quite literally means happy mountain, which is exactly why we are here. First, to celebrate Daniela's birthday. And second, because we really needed a city break. We've spent the last six months in Phnom Penh, a very chaotic and somewhat overstimulating city. And for the most part, we've been stuck indoors, either working at home, stuck in front of screens, or in lockdown. And if we're not at home, we're probably outdoors, stuck in traffic, very divorced from nature. And that is not good for the human body and causes something known as nature deficit disorder, which is the topic of today's video. But let me give you a little taste of our general surroundings. It's really, really beautiful. Okay, I'm quite deep in the forest. I think we can stop right here and unpackage this concept. Nature Deficit Disorder, what is it? Well, it's a term or an idea that was first coined by Richard Louvre in 2005. And it's this basic idea that humans are hardwired to function best when they are in nature. And so when we are removed from nature and put in indoor environments, say at home or in our cars, we do not function optimally. On the contrary, we are prone to problems and numerous disorders like ADD, ADHD, obesity, depression, and these are all problems that are increasing throughout society and they're likely to only get worse in the near future. And we'll get back to that, but first, why is this all happening? Well, this rather sad phenomenon resulting in all these negative mental and physical health issues, and for the most part in cities, is sort of self-inflicted. Not so much by individuals not being proactive and going outside, but by the people who shape and influence the built environment and groups of individuals like those who work in the broader automotive industry who have lobbied for decades to have our cities built around the car as opposed to around people. And in extreme cases, this has resulted in very dangerous, polluted and unattractive walking and outdoor living environments. And urban and transport planners like myself, we have sort of facilitated the automotive industry and we have 
failed as a community to create very livable spaces for people. These are spaces that would allow us to sit and relax and enjoy the world by integrating a lot of green infrastructure. And so many kids that now grow up in cities, they spend very little time outdoors from a very young age. And they do suffer from these problems and they don't know that they are actually longing for more immersion in the natural world. I'm not sure if you agree, but I think technologists who build very addictive apps, they are also to blame. And these are known as the attention economy conglomerates who really distract us from the real world and keep us plugged into these virtual worlds, whether we are gaming or on social media. And I read somewhere that checking for likes is like the new smoking. And all of this keeps us indoors and contributes to all these disorders. Okay, I feel like I'm getting a little bit sunburned here. So let's move to a different location and we'll talk about the physiological and psychological effects of not being in nature enough. Oh my goodness, that's like a snake-sized centipede. Let me find a rock I can be sure there is no dangerous insect waiting to bite me on. How about here? Okay, let's get into the three main psychological and physiological impact of not being immersed enough in nature. And we previously talked about ADD, obesity, depression, but there's also less pronounced disorders like reduced creativity and cognition, increased anxiety, and of course, burnout. And there's been a number of experimental studies. One from the University of Illinois, which examined and compared the impact of 20 minutes spent in an urban versus a park environment on the concentration levels of children with ADHD. The research found that just 20 minutes in the park had the same effect as a dose of methyphenidate, also known as Ritalin, concluding that doses of nature serve as a safe, inexpensive, and widely accessible new tool in the toolkit for managing ADHD, which is certainly compelling, but perhaps nature is not so much a cure to ADHD, but that a lack of it is the cause. And maybe we should be rethinking the environments in which we educate our kids. Another issue that can arise from too little exposure to nature is that of myopia, which is short-sightedness. Because so many of us are spending so much time indoors and often in front of screens, we are weakening our eyes. So if you are working long hours indoors in front of a screen, try to at least set yourself up next to a window and take regular breaks to look into the distance. And also a nice small thing you can do is have a houseplant next to your desk to trick your brain into thinking it's outdoors. And another thing, I don't know if this works, but I have started doing it too, is changing your desktop backgrounds to one of nature, just to sort of trick your brain to thinking that it's in its natural habitat. So a third and final impact is a reduced respect for the environment. So not being exposed enough to nature doesn't just affect us personally at a mental and physical level, but also affects the health of the planet. And what I'm getting at with this is if you and I, we spend more time indoors, there is a much higher likelihood that we care a lot less about the degradation of our planet versus if we were spending much more time in the outdoors which creates somewhat of a negative cycle where the less green infrastructure our cities have, the more time we are likely to spend indoors. And the more time we spend indoors, the less likely it is that our cities will build this green infrastructure. But what we really need is to reverse this trend, which is really quite challenging. And start spending more time outdoors and more time voicing our want and need to have this green infrastructure but many people don't acknowledge that that is something that they need so really what to do and i'll get to that a little later in the video but first let's move on <laughs> my neck is super red and of course this is all really quite worrying because we need nature and we need lots of it Frequent contact with nature has shown to increase creativity and cognitive development, reduce stress and anxiety, but it also creates a sense of connection and wonder for and with 
the world. And another interesting piece of science has shown that frequent exposure to nature also helps us heal. For example, there's an interesting study on the recovery of 23 hospital patients between 1972 and 1981, which looked at the restorative influence of patients having a window with a view on nature versus patients with a view on a brick wall. And the findings revealed that having a view on nature resulted in a quicker recovery and an overall better mood and better sleep. And so seeing as our bodies are always in some sort of state of recovery, we therefore need to always be around nature. And yes, it's quite a dated study with a small sample size, but I do think it tells a nice story. And at this point in the video, I hope you're starting to see the important role of nature in our lives and the risks of not being exposed enough to nature. Next, I'd like to cover what can you and I do as individuals to sort of increase our exposure to nature. And for that, I'm gonna head back to Phnom Penh and show you my strategies, but also talk about what's being done in other places in the world. Let's go. <laughs> we are back in chaotic Phnom Penh. You can see all the traffic and hear the sound of construction. And it's quite amazing, even after just a couple days immersed in nature, when you get back to the city, you can really taste the pollution and feel a tingling in the back of your throat. Now I'd like to talk about nature deficit disorder, what we can do about it as individuals, but also as a society. And to do so, I'm gonna stop right here. As an individual, quite obviously, actively try to spend more time in nature, whether it's after work, on the weekend, or even during work breaks, try to block out some time to go outside and get away from the screens. And I know options might be limited in the city that you live in, in my case here in Phnom Penh, unless I cross over into the neighboring province of Kandal, there's really only one half decent place with good forest nature cover that I can think of. And it's right here in Wat Phnom, a Buddhist temple complex that's actually also the center of a roundabout. Let me show you around. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's two little red squirrels up there. And that's something I really like about Wat Phnom. As a park, it's not overly manicured like the one at Independence Monument. Here you have some old trees. It feels a lot more like a forest and with all the different varieties of vegetation, you attract a lot more wildlife. So I do try to come here maybe one or two hours a week. It often doesn't happen. And sometimes I need a little more than just an escape too. Well, the roundabout and I go over to Kandal province where I cycle all afternoon but sometimes you need even more than just an afternoon in nature and there's an interesting concept in Japan known as Shinrin Yoku and Shinrin Yoku is this Japanese concept of forest bathing that's practiced by many who live in the big cities and need an escape and it literally translates to taking in the forest through our senses so seeing hearing feeling and tasting. Japanese friends, feel free to correct me if I am wrong. And it looks a little bit like this. It involves leaving behind all technology to go wander aimlessly with no set destination, with the sole purpose of savoring the nature, where you go out, take deep breaths, listen to the singing birds and the breeze rustling in the leaves, notice the sunlight filtering through the branches, smell the fragrances of the forest, Place your hands on the trunk of a tree, enjoy the calm, feel the happiness. <laughs> this is really starting to sound like a guided meditation. Back to the video. I really love this concept of forest bathing, but we can't all just escape our daily jobs and go into the forest. So maybe there's a middle ground where we go and take forest showers, like what I'm doing right now in Wat Phnom, or what I do when I go cycling in Kandal. And then every now and then, as part of one of our maybe annual holidays, we go and take a proper forest bath. And I have done that in the past. Around this time last year, I took my dad's bike and cycled across Belgium and Luxembourg, where I was completely disconnected from technology, except my cameras, and much more connected with the environment. So that's something I would like to make an annual sort of event because it was extremely relaxing because I really had seven full days of just me and myself thinking with my mind and just digesting all the craziness of 
life. But in a perfect world, I wish I didn't have to escape the city to get my daily, weekly, or annual dose of nature. It would be nice if nature could instead come to me in the city. So what can we do as a society to facilitate this? And I'm gonna cover this through my lens as an urban and transport planner, and also build off the assumption that we will continue to be an urban species, which for me makes most sense. Cities are the most economically and environmentally sustainable way for humans to come together, at least as we know it, but they're not very socially sustainable. So we really do need to rethink how we plan, engineer, and design our cities and find a way to live in greater harmony with nature. Instead of trying to eradicate nature like what has been happening in Phnom Penh with the draining of the lakes, for example, just over here, there used to be a large lake serving as a natural drainage system called Boim Kak, which they drained to make way for concrete towers. And surprise, surprise, it is now prone to flooding. And this is a phenomenon that's happening all over the world where city planners and developers are removing and eradicating nature to try to maximize the value of the land. But in doing so, they often end up overlooking this very important and basic human need of nature. Okay, I'm gonna get a move on because it looks like it's about to start raining. And when it rains here, it really pours. But one thing that I would really like to see from cities is more green corridors, which people can use to commute throughout the city. And a green corridor is essentially a passageway where people can walk and cycle or use any form of non-motorized transport that is separated or segregated from vehicular traffic. And some cities do this extremely well. Hamburg in Germany, a city I spent 10 years living and cycling in, does this extremely well. Hamburg has an extensive network of green corridors that link the city center with outer urban areas along 12 axes. So someone in Hamburg can go pretty much anywhere in the city without having to spend much time in mixed traffic. Some other cities that are much more dense, look at New York in Western Manhattan, for example, they had to be a lot more creative and there they repurposed a railway line and created the High Line, a 2.3 kilometer long elevated pedestrian walkway that provides people with an alternative to walking at street level. And if you've been to New York, you know the city streets can be really quite stressful. But what's most interesting about the High Line is how it actually increased surrounding land values upwards of 50% quite an extreme case in an already unaffordable city, but it shows us that we can and should value nature because people are willing to pay an economic price for it. So city planners and developers, instead of eradicating nature, they can and should put a price on it because people are happy to pay for it. And another thing is cities need to be more proactive in protecting, conserving, and bringing back nature through regulation and policy. And there are some good cities with really good examples. But we will cover that in a future video. This brings us to the end. And I really hope at the very least that this video has opened up your eyes to the important role of nature in our cities. And cities, after all, are increasingly our homes. So we really might as well plan, design, and engineer them right. And this particular concept, Nature Deficit Disorder, I first read about in 2012 in Jeremy Rifkins' book, The Third Industrial Revolution. And I've never heard anybody speak about it since. So I thought, why not make this deep dive explainer video Video, and I highly recommend watching a talk on the Vice channel by Jeremy Rifkin. It's probably one of the most important videos you can watch on the internet. And by the way, I am now back home in the concrete jungle that is Phnom Penh, but it is now four months into the future. These videos really are huge projects and take a lot of time to get off the ground, um, which is in part why I haven't been able to get a haircut. <laughs> it's getting a bit crazy. Um, because I like to be able to sort of warp the time in my edits and all this time, money and energy spent editing is time not spent outdoors. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Likes and subscriptions are after all the only metrics I can use to gauge your interest. And also at the beginning of the year, I set the goal of getting 1000 subscribers. We've got about two months to go and I'm still trying 
trying to get 140 more. So please like the video, subscribe to the channel and share it to someone you think might benefit from understanding nature deficit disorder. Regardless, I have many videos like this one scheduled for 2022. So do please stick around. And if you have any good urbanism video ideas you would like to see me cover, feel free to write them in the comment section below or message me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Very, very lastly, I will also follow up on this video with another video that deep dives into selected cities that are doing a particularly good job at reincorporating or protecting nature. So I look forward to producing that one. I have a number of guests lined up and hopefully some international travel, world permitting. That's it for now. Take good care.